Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Brett Canada, aka the Juice Feaster on socials. And Brett has transformed his life through the power of juicing and raw foods. And I just would rather he shared his story. So if you don't mind, Brett, could you just share a little bit about your health journey? Because it's quite interesting, especially coming from a farming background. Um, yeah, I, fi I find the, the contrast now quite quite amazing. So yeah. If you could just share a little bit into your journey, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Dylan, for um, having me on your channel. I appreciate the work that you do and, and appreciate, uh, you know, all that you do to, the, to spread the message in the community for sure. So um, for me, gosh, as you mentioned, growing up on a farm in the Midwest of the United States was uh, kind of a unique experience. I had a great childhood, um, uh, you know, very wholesome upbringing, but also at the same time, as a, as a sixth generation farm kid, I was a, a meat, in a meat and potatoes family. You know, we um, were livestock farmers, uh, had cattle and grain, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lived that Midwestern lifestyle, but you know, it was meat and potatoes. It was fast food. Both my parents, in addition to being farmers, had jobs off the farm, so they were very busy. And you know, to make sure that we ate, oftentimes it wasn't always whole food. There were processed foods, or you know, after school we'd go to McDonald's and, and have fast food. So, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up. You know, even though I was in, in a very wholesome farm-based lifestyle, I grew up on the standard American diet. You know, um, when I went to college, I certainly uh, lived that same lifestyle. And, and being a college student and a young person, I, I really didn't have any health issues, never had had any health issues. So just continued to do what I'd always done with my life, and that's just, you know, eat, eat the standard American diet. Um, I did, I did, uh, you know, when I got to college, I was exposed to uh, way more ideas and way more diversity in terms of lifestyles and, you know, being a fairly sheltered farm kid in the Midwest, uh, my eyes were, were greatly open when I got to college in, in a, you know, a larger university mm. to see uh, all sorts of different lifestyles. and. I'd always been interested in the outdoors. I, I was always, you know, um, going out to the woods and playing in the creek and all these things growing up. And so I felt myself drawn to the environmental crowd in, uh, in, when I was at university and joined a couple of uh, environmental, student environmental organizations. And when I joined up with those, I got exposed to these freaks, weirdos, <laughs> you know, that ate vegan food, like, <laughs> what, what the heck is this? Like, what's a, what's a vegetarian? What's a vegan? Yeah. Like, why would you not ever want to eat meat? Or, you know, what's, what's wheatgrass juice? You know, like all these kind of crazy ideas started to be, I started to be exposed to them. And so it kind of opened my eyes initially to um, some, some alternative lifestyles, which was, which was cool for me. And growing up on a farm, I knew there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to come back to the farm uh, for a career. You know, farming had changed from kind of the small agrarian uh, lifestyle, um, you know, subsistence type, life type lifestyle to much larger corporate agriculture. And so I just, you know, there really wasn't any, as far as I saw, any opportunity for me to come back to the farm for a career. So I decided to actually pursue uh, food science, food chemistry, which was a way to, in my mind at the time, stay involved with the field of agriculture, uh, but you know, in a in a way that I could actually make a career out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, interest, interestingly enough, I got involved in the juice industry. So um, not not fresh juices, but my first career out of school was product development and formulation for a cranberry juice company in Wisconsin. So I went to work for this cranberry juice company. Um, I basically worked on formulations and flavorings and all the things that food scientists do to take uh, you know, an agricultural product and 
package it and extend the shelf life and mm -hmm. preserve it and all of these things. So from there, I basically had a career of 25 years in the juice industry, but wow. not in the fresh juice industry. So I saw all the ways that uh, juice gets packaged and handled and processed and pasteurized and basically made into a dead sterile juice. So it's, mm. it's kind of ironic that here I am today, you know, 30 years later, still in the juice industry, but uh, doing it in a way that's much more healthful. Mm. Um, that's kind of my career background. Um, but from a health perspective, uh, you know, I pretty much did whatever I wanted. I ate what I wanted. I drank what I wanted. Um, I didn't have any health issues really until I got up into my 40s. And it seemed to be, you know, the, the aches and pains started to happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the weight gain started to happen. Um, I started getting sick consistently, whereas before I, you know, had no issues whatsoever. But, you know, two or three times a year, it started out getting sore throats and bronchitis. Um, uh, you know, every six months getting so bad such that I would need to, I felt the need at the time to go to a med check or, you know, my doctor's office and, and get checked. And usually I had, you know, strep throat or something like that. And mm -hmm. they would give me an antibiotic and it was the same cycle. Just like it kept getting more and more frequent, more and more common, just um, uh, more recurrences of these these uh, issues and so fast forward up until about um, 2013 and it just kept getting worse like I kept getting these more frequent occurrences of, of uh, health issues until it really kind of bottomed out for me I had uh, a lump in my groin um, you know uh, tremendous pain sore throat um, cough, I, I would get this cough to where I could, couldn't catch my breath, and at one particular uh, point in 2013, I, it got so bad, I went into, the, went into the emergency room and they diagnosed me with shingles. So I had a really bad case of shingles in a place where you don't want to get shingles, and it's usually, usually where, it, where it happens. And so at this point in time, I was no longer working in the corporate world, but my wife and I had started a winery. We were actually uh, making and producing fruit wines and honey wines and still in the juice business, just the fermented juice business. Yeah, always and, like the fruit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I've always been involved with fruit. You know, we were getting fresh fruit and making the wines and agricultural products and making the wines, um, but not necessarily the best form of, of fruit, uh, fruit to consume for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and I was certainly my, my best, my own best customer. I, I drank a lot, you know, I, I, uh, if I was going out to dinner, you know, my thoughts about where I was going out to dinner always revolved out around where I could get something to drink too, you know, mm -hmm. so from an alcohol, alcohol perspective, uh, that was a big part of my life. But at this particular point in time, um, I had about two weeks uh, where I was on my back with shingles and I had uh, some time to really think about is this the way I want the rest of my life to go you know is mm -hmm. this how I want the rest of my you know well wellness um, experience to be in the life you know coming from having really no issues to kind of gradually coming up to this place of poor health I felt like it was a, a crossroads for me to make a decision so I put some thought on it. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. I read a lot. Uh, a lot of the people that I still follow today in terms of um, inspiration, in terms of what I do today, uh, I had been spending a lot of time watching these folks, people like Dan McDonald, um, you know, uh, at the time David Wolf. Um, Mm -hmm. some of the early people in the raw foods movement and it, it just really resonated with me Ted Carr all these people uh, resonated with me in terms of, of uh, a lifestyle that could really turn mm. the turn the ship around for me so at the end of 2013 uh, I decided that I no longer wanted to go that route I wanted to take a different path so I 
talked with my wife and I said, hey, what do you think about going vegan? I really <laughs> think this might be a good way to turn around my health issues. And so she was like, well, I think it's crazy, but let's do it. So it actually ended up being 2014 when we made that switch. And from there, I've never looked back. And initially, things got better. You know, the aches and pains went away. Uh, at my heaviest, I was up to about 225 pounds. Um, wow. uh, gradually, that weight started to come off, started to melt away. Um, I had re recurring back problems uh, and, and joint, joint pain, joint aches. My hands would ache. I was in a manufacturing facility making wine. So, you know, I was using my hands a lot and my body a lot. And so a lot of those aches and pains went away and things got better, you know. Uh, but I felt like there was more. I felt like there was mm. another layer, another level uh, that I could get to. I remembered from my youth just having unbridled energy and unbridled health and having no issues whatsoever. And I felt like there was something more. And so I started digging a little bit deeper and I found people like uh, Sprout Man, Steve Meyerowitz, and um, you know, also Dan McDonald, people who were really incorporating a lot of juice, Lou Corona, um, folks like that who were spending uh, lengths of time uh, abstaining from solid food and flooding themselves with juice. And knowing what I knew about fruit and the power of fruit, you know, through my beverage beverage world experience, um, I, f I just felt called to have time to give myself a break from solid food. It just mm. resonated with me to give my system a break, to um, give it an opportunity to do what I felt like uh, could do best to get me to the na that next level. So I got out my old juicer. I had bought a juicer right after I graduated from college. Uh, it was an old champion juicer. And like a lot, a lot of people, you know, I juiced with it for a little while right after college and then threw it in the cabinet and it gathered dust. But I still had it and I dusted it off and just, I really didn't know what I was doing, but I just started throwing stuff in it. Celery, pineapple, apples, dandelion greens, celery, just, whatever I could, and um, I started noticing some changes, you know? I started uh, finding, I started feeling like I was finding that next level. Uh, mm. One specific um, example that I can think of, uh, in our manufacturing facility, I was doing something and I'd hit my leg um, with uh, something heavy that had made like a bruise on the side of my leg, on my calf. And, you know, usually that bruise will be there for a few days and then go away. Well, in this case, it actually had developed into kind of a hard lump. And it had been there for several months. And I wasn't really sure what was going on with it um, and didn't particularly at that point want to go to the doctor. I was beginning to kind of have a different perspective of the advice given by medical professionals. and. Mm. Um, I, I don't get me wrong. I certainly appreciate medicine in terms of its ability to take care of emergency situations and for sure, yeah, fractures and and uh, emergency surgeries and things of that nature. And I've benefited from it, no doubt. But when it comes to preventative um, issues, I was beginning to change my perspective on that based on what I was doing on my own. And so as I started flooding myself with juice, like I was getting up to like a couple of liters of green juice a day, after about a week, this lump went away on the side of my leg. And I was like, hmm, mm. I think we might be getting somewhere here. So <laughs> I just kept doing it. I just kept adding more and more juice into my day to the point to where I was actually replacing solid food meals with, with juice and I just felt more energy, I felt lighter, I was, uh, you know, losing some of the visceral, visceral fat that I, that I had. Um, it just, it, I felt like I was getting to that next level. Mm. And so at that point I felt like, you know, I wonder if I could go a number of days without having solid food. 
So I attempted it a few times and failed miserably. So I would set out to do like a three day cleanse for the weekend, like a juice fast, and I would make it to like Saturday evening or Sunday morning and I was like, oh, I can't do this, I'm starving. Let's, let's go get brunch, let's get a pizza, you know, yeah. just like something like that and I would break. And I could never figure out exactly what I was doing wrong until I realized I just wasn't getting enough calories. Mm -hmm. And so I came across uh, a video from John Rose uh, talking about uh, juice, juice feasting. And I was like, that's an interesting concept, like a feast versus a fast. And so I started to look at what I was consuming when I was doing the cleanses that I was doing. And literally I was getting like 800 calories, you know, like I was literally mm -hmm. Um, barely getting enough calories to maintain, you know, uh, a basal metabolic function. Mm. And so uh, I was like, I'm just going to start drinking juice until I can't drink it anymore. I'm going to get as many calories as I can get or as I would be getting if I was eating solid food just on juice. So, so I started calculating, okay, how many calories in a liter of pineapple juice? How many calories in a liter of watermelon juice? And so instead of looking at volume, I was looking at caloric content. And when I did that, it was like a watershed moment. And so I'm very thankful to uh, folks like John Rose and Dan McDonald who kind of advocate more John Rose, I suppose. But uh, it was a turning point for me where I... I figured out then that I could go for longer periods of time and actually reap the rewards of, of being on juice only for a long period of time. So I was like, okay, I can do this. Three days, it's a snap. You know, I was getting 2,000 mm. to 2,500 calories in juice. I had energy, I could work. I, you know, I was in a stressful business that my wife and I were running. You know, I was running a very physical manufacturing um, facility. And so I was able to do all these things and at the same time uh, give my body the opportunity to cleanse, regenerate, and heal. So when I figured that out, I was off to the races. So that's kind of the start to the, to the uh, not really finish, but start to where I really began, began gaining some ground in terms, in terms of my health. So a little bit of mm. history there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that's spot on with the calories. Like, it makes complete sense, but you know, it, there's there's no longevity to an approach where it's it's basically starvation, like, yeah. like you said. Yeah, then you're just gonna binge. But just um, people might be wondering, like, how old are you now? Um, and yeah, what's like what what weight do you like roughly sit at now? Because yeah, I'm I'm 51 now. I'll be 52 in February. So. Wow. Uh, I usually, I don't weigh myself too often. I think the last time I weighed myself, I was right around 160 pounds. Wow. So from my worst. Uh, 65 pounds, yeah. Yeah, roughly 65 pounds, wow. 60, 65 yeah. pounds. And, you know, I think about that, like, I think about picking up, like, a 50-pound bag of topsoil mm. or sand or something like that. And imagine what that's like to carry just physically just to carry it but in addition to that what my organs would have to be doing mm. to struggle to keep that extra weight alive or mm. uh, and it just kind of boggles my mind that that I did that you know I'm in a way I'm grateful I'm, I'm super grateful that I had the experience that I had I don't wish anyone go through that in terms of what I experienced but I'm super grateful that that old Brett experienced that, that old version of me experienced that so that mm. um, he could kind of hit rock bottom and figure out how to become a new person. And I literally feel like a new person. I am a new person from mm. from what I was back then. So I'm, I'm super grateful for that experience. For sure, yeah, you definitely look like one. Like you oh, kind you. of radiate vitality now. Like I'll put on screen at the start, I would have put on screen the before and after. And sure. I, I just think it's amazing. It's amazing, like like you say, it's two different people. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, in terms of like, I've heard you talk about, um, use the analogy of livestock in the past, mm -hmm. changing food too quickly. Yeah. And I also agree with that. I think a more gradual approach to some things can be good. Totally. So, so in terms of juicing, would you recommend 
first of all, like, why would someone want to maybe do like a juice feast? Um, and would you recommend people jump straight in or maybe take a more gradual approach like yourself? Like, what do you, yeah, what do you feel? You know, I think it's different for everyone, but I personally recommend if someone comes to me, I recommend a more gradual approach. And mm -hmm. the reason why I think about that as being more optimal is that my experience growing up on a farm, uh, we were always, uh, you know, learning on how to optimally feed, feed our livestock, be it sheep or pigs or cattle. And one of the things that we would experience if we made any kind of change to their, their feed or their rations abruptly, um, it would be a, a very, uh, sometimes they would get sick. They would fall ill from that rapid transition. And even with pets like uh, uh, dogs and cats, if you make a quick change to their, their food or whatever it is in their routine, mm -hmm. it can be pretty, pretty shocking. And so, even though, let's say someone is on a standard American diet, even though what they're doing, if they make an abrupt switch to raw foods or juices or smoothies, like all at once, you would think, wow, I'm doing all this amazing stuff. But it's such a shock to the system. Your, mm. your microbiome has been populated with organisms that are used to consuming or really suited to consuming, you consuming standard American diet foods. And the next thing you know, you're throwing wheatgrass at it. And it's like, whoa, what's this? And like those organisms are just in shock. Your microbiome's in shock. Your organs are in shock. Like your body is, your, your mm. liver is purging. Um, your lymph is moving all at once where it wasn't before. It's just a really uh, sharp transition to do it abruptly. And I think there are some people that can weather that, and, and, uh, but it's tough. It can be really um, shocking to think, wow, I'm doing all this good stuff, but I feel like hell warmed over, you know, like I, I have headaches, you know, my, mm. my bowels are all messed up, you know, like I, I can't sleep. And so I really advocate for making a, a more gradual transition if you can. You know, I think there are some instances where people are like, okay, it's stage four, you know, terminal and like we got, it's go time, you know? Yeah. I think I think sometimes that sense of urgency can be there um, where it might be imperative for someone to just go, you know, all in. But if you're working on developing a consistent long-term lifestyle, then I really recommend easing into it, giving your body a chance to repopulate with the organisms that are suited to, you know, this new lifestyle. Mm. Yeah, and definitely. And it can be just, you know, adding in 16 ounces of juice, you know, just starting with a little bit of green juice and maybe not too heavy on the greens, you know, more fruit, uh, you know, more fruit than greens and then just working it, working it to where your system gets adjusted to it and, and better suited for it. If you're enjoying the video this far, you'll like my free community full of like-minded people looking to get fit, vibrant, healthy, lean, happy, you name it, energetic. Yeah, so I'll leave that top link in the description. Enjoy the rest of the video and eat your fruit, baby. Mm, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I agree with that, especially. Um, I think, yeah, it's obviously, like you say, it's depending on the, the circumstance, it may need a bit more urgency, but yeah, definitely. What, what Did you personally, obviously you weaned onto it kind of gradually or weaned off the other foods, like, mm -hmm. did you experience many detox symptoms when you kind of embarked on ju uh, juice feasting? Uh, not really. I feel like since I had uh, transitioned on to plant-based, you know, vegan living, uh, that was a transition away from the yeah. animal products and the dairy. My body had adjusted to that. And I, I really, even though I was adding a lot of juice all at once, I was already eating a lot of salads and, and fruit and things of that nature, uh, uh, as opposed to what I had been doing before. So I think my body was fairly well used to the raw foods um, in, in more plentiful amounts. And so when I started adding in juices, I really didn't have too many problems uh, with detox symptoms or you know my body abruptly reacting to uh, to that. So I think for me it was more of a gradual transition. 
Mm -hmm. uh, certainly when I started doing uh, juice fasting, juice feasting, uh, I worked up to that. I didn't just say, all right, I'm going to try this and I'm going to go for 150 days. You know, I said, I want to see if I can make it 24 hours on juice or I want to see if I can make it through the afternoon on juice and then have a solid food meal in the evening. And so once I worked my way up uh, of attempting a few times getting through a weekend, like two or three days at a time on juice and feeling good after doing so, I was like, okay, I can do a week. I can do 14 days. I can do 21 days. Mm -hmm. And so when I actually, for me, I got up to um, three or four days and at that point, I felt pretty confident that I could do a 30-day. And when I did a 30-day, that was really where Juice Feaster was born. That was where my uh, social media account was born. So it was January of 2018. Um, I set out to do a 30-day. That was kind of my New Year's resolution, kick off the year to a great start, smoke out whatever is in my body and get it <laughs> running, you know, just like, just give my body that full reset, hit the reset button, the restart button, and go from, go from scratch. And um, I set up a Juice Feaster Instagram account in the fall of 2017, just kind of toying with the idea. And it really was a way to have some accountability um, publicly. You know, like we can make sometimes these, these commitments on paper, but it's nice to have a buddy. You know, it's nice to have a buddy to call and say, hey, you know, I didn't have such a great day today, or I had an amazing day today, or I ate some fruit today, or I, you know, I, I went and went and went and got, uh, you know, something at a fast food joint or something. I never, mm -hmm. I never did that, but it's nice to have someone. You're, we're human, you know. We, we're not perfect, so it's nice to have somebody to communicate with and chat with about it. So. Setting up that Juice Feaster account was kind of my accountability mechanism to have um, publicly made a statement. I'm setting out to do this. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to document it. And let's see how it goes. Just show up and see what happens. And uh, away, it, away it went from there. It was the most, to me, it was the most transformational 30 days um, really of my life because during that 30 days, I really felt what it felt like to be a real human again. You know, mm. I had uh, boundless energy. I was sleeping well. I was able to maintain my job, my business um, at a level unheard of in the past. I was working long days. I was going for runs. You know, I was I was working out and maintaining all my other responsibilities and consuming nothing but juice. Um, so it was really a, a watershed moment for me, such that it was so transformational that during that time, I decided I no longer wanted to be in the alcohol business. I was gonna change my career and make my life be a dedication to help other people feel as good as what I was feeling during that 30 days. And that's what I did, it took us about a year to uh, transition out of that that um, business that my wife and I had. We made a decision to sell the business. It took us about a year to find a buyer. And in 2019 summer, we exited out of the business. And I've been doing what I do now ever since, which is help people to do to do what I do to feel as good as I feel every day. So mm. it was super transformational for me. It was so much though that I changed my entire uh, life course so that's how powerful it was for me mm, absolutely yeah I think I think people can see that in the way you convey yourself and just uh, that you can tell there's passion behind your words like it's um yeah it's definitely transformational and a lot of people a lot of people it's such a hot topic like mucoid plaque and old waste and things sure. I'm curious during your many um, juice feasts did you ever see any like old hard waste coming out or anything like that and uh did you did you take any of the clays like psyllium husk things like that because a lot of people recommend that yeah for sure on all the uh, juice feasts that i do i usually involve uh, a bentonite clay product actually i use um, one i really like from Pyridime. it's their cleanse powder 
It's mm -hmm. a mixture of some different herbs as well as bentonite clay, uh, psyllium husk, uh, but it's super gentle um, and I find it's a great augmentation to help kind of support the body's elimination uh, system through, through the GI tract. Um, in terms of seeing uh, old waste and old material come out, for sure, you know, there, were, there was a lot of things that came out of me. You know, whether I can say it's mucoid plaque or not, or um, I, can't, I can't say, you know, yeah. I can't say exactly whether or not that's what it was, but I did have, you know, ropey-like material come out, whether that was a combination of, you know, mucus and the bentonite clay material, I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I know is that my life transformed by virtue of doing it, and so uh, with that, you know, I can't say what it all was that came out of me, but I led a pretty conventional lifestyle for, you know, 40 plus years. I can only imagine what was in there. Mm. And I feel pretty certain that I, I did a lot of good by getting a lot of that out for sure. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. I think people fixate on terms and words mm -hmm. and like specifics and it's just at the end of the day, you feel a lot better and <laughs> that's sure. what matters. Yeah, but yeah absolutely. obviously you're helping people now what mm -hmm. kind of let's say what are like common mistakes you see uh when people kind of they say oh i've tried a bit of juicing but you know it didn't work for me or yeah like how should how should people um yeah I embark think on it yeah i think probably certainly some people do you have problems um and i think this can be the case with any drastic switch of dietary lifestyle or really mm. any kind of lifestyle. Um, you know, you can, you can find people who have gone keto, who have had great experiences versus those that have had terrible experiences. You can find people who have gone vegan, who have um, had great experiences and those that have had terrible experiences and become ex-vegans. You can find any number of people who have, um, you know, a, a, a trumpet about what experience it is that they have. And so I think it really is um, through the lens of that individual as to what's happened for them. You know, we can't say what's, what's uh, their truth through our lens. So we have to kind of appreciate it, what it, what it is and where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, I think the people that I've talked with who have had problems with juicing or juice fasting or juice feasting, I think I can usually find a couple of things that they do differently than what I do. I'm not saying they're doing it wrong and I'm not saying yeah. that um, uh, perhaps it, it, it's entirely what caused their issues, but for me, I usually find that people that have problems aren't consuming enough calories. Um, they have done it rather abruptly. They've made their switches rather abruptly. They've lacked consistency uh, in terms of how long that they've done something. I often find there's a lot of what I would call roller coasting involved where they're trying a lot of different approaches. They try paleo for 30 days. They try, you know, the uh, 75 hard for 75 days and then they jump into a keto strict keto uh, routine and then they jump on to juicing for 21 a 21 day cleanse and I just find a lot of uh, jumping from mm. um, lifestyle to lifestyle if I look at their history and I think this is really problematic for the human body to experience these drastic changes um, uh, consistently and I think mm. I usually find those are the common threads of people that have problems with the juicing part of it is they've been working on a lot of different things uh, frequently you know in the course of the year they might be trying four or five different different lifestyles and that's just very difficult for the body to uh, adjust to uh, I think consistency is key no matter what it is you're doing for sure mm. Mm. yeah absolutely the yo-yo and I yeah. think, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's difficult because there's so many trends. Obviously people yeah. see this and then they see someone maybe gets short-term benefit with it. Yeah. Like you say, Absolutely. it's not a, a long-term 
sustainable lifestyle though mm -hmm. so what what would you what would you do in that case just say like maybe juicing is a bit too extreme for someone what would you advocate like a more transitional diet or yeah yeah definitely i you know oftentimes if people are having problems i would just encourage them to kind of throw the trends out the window throw the extremes out the window and and, mm. and maybe even focus less on diet uh as a whole you know i think yeah. oftentimes we get so obsessed with it um and here I am, you know, my whole platform is about juicing. So, you know, who am I to say this? But I think there's way more to our health and well-being than, than just what we consume. You know, there's the music we listen to, the people that we hang around with, the, uh, the media that we consume, the stress with our workplace or our colleagues or our family members, um, you know, how we react to situations driving on the highway or riding our bicycle or meeting someone on the street. Mm. So there's so many variables. I think being hyper-focused on just diet and lifestyle, uh, I think might be uh, in, in some cases not the best approach. So I often will tell people to just kind of pull back a little bit from the extreme trends or the extreme things. I would much rather see someone just eat a whole food plant-based diet consistently and not be stressed out about it and not be logging their calories in the chronometer just work on eating more fruit or you know uh, avoiding processed foods or just staying consistent on something a little more basic and a little more um, uh, you know manageable and less extreme and I think then once you're once you're able to maintain that for a year consistently without any issues then maybe think about throwing in some uh you know juice cleansing and and i think oftentimes we get so tied up in these trends or extremes that it, it throws us off in the wrong direction so that would be my advice and whatever you do whatever switch you make make it gradually if you have the opportunity to do so mm. yeah absolutely like you said there's so many aspects to health and i i think a hyper fixation on any one aspect often mm -hmm. leads to like deficits in other areas Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I think yeah. for me too, something that I experienced was um, there was a need to kind of uh, use my platform as a way to say, this is the best way. This is the only way. This is the truth. And I think it's not such a wise thing uh, to say. Um, and I think there are way more opportunities for us to live uh, you know, in a less extreme manner and, and as opposed to me preaching what my truth is. I can, I can show what I do and what makes me feel good, but I think ultimately it's got to work for you and it's got to resonate with you. Um, so I think rounding out that experience for people in terms of their overall health and well-being um, in more areas than just the food we consume is probably my best advice. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think especially with like online the online world you're told like yeah. niche down or you need like a usp like a unique selling point and then yeah. but i guess you can kind of pull people in with that and then once they're in then you talk about other things as well and just yeah 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 totally i i answer a lot of dms as, as best as i can i try and catch all of them and questions range all over the place from you know how much juice should i drink to you know, how long should I drink this one juice to cleanse my kidneys? I'm like, well, every day for the rest of your life. You know, like this is, uh, this is, I think oftentimes we take juicing or whatever it is, almost we're so conditioned and programmed from a pharmaceutical perspective that we take this medication for seven days or we take this regimen for mm. 21 days and then we're, we're done with it. But it doesn't work like that. You can't, you can't take, uh, one juice for you know seven days one beet juice and expect your blood pressure to be healed you know uh, so I, I like to when when anyone asks I just like to reiterate reiterate that you can't keep um, consuming all the things that were the root cause of your issue and then take this beet juice recipe and expect it to counteract all the damage you're doing with the root causes. We have to think about what the root causes of our, of our illnesses. And you know, it could be dietary, 
but it could be epigenetic. You know, we're dealing with generational trauma in some cases, and here mm. again, everyone's experience is different. You know, my family came from Europe generations ago. I don't know what they experienced. I have no idea the trials and tribulations that they experienced uh, in daily life and what that brought into my genetics. But to be able to unravel that through you know, meditation or trauma therapy or whatever, I think, you know, we can begin to be more well-rounded with our, our health and well-being than saying, take this juice for 30 days and then you're good. It's not mm. like that. It doesn't work like that. You know, we can't expect to come off of a 30-day juice feast, no matter how amazing it was, and expect us to be able to go back to all of the root causes that caused our, or were a big part of our illnesses and just expect to go on with life as normal. No, it doesn't work like that. We have to mm. be very consistent and make it a lifestyle, not a cleanse. That's, I think, one of the biggest things that I learned throughout uh, my experience is that it's just got to be consistent. You got to stay consistent. You got to stay true to it, whatever that is. Don't be too extreme, but, but don't go off the rails either. Mm, definitely. Yeah, I think it's that quick fixes uh, mindset and mentality that like oh it's okay I'll, I'll do all the other detrimental behaviors because i can mm -hmm. cleanse or detox yeah. and yeah you, you just like you say you want it to be an enjoyable lifestyle you want it to be yeah. sustainable if you're yeah. not enjoying it like like now i'm at the stage where you know i crave fruit and things like that mm -hmm. I, other things don't appeal but mm -hmm. yeah if, if you're if you're kind of like doing it begrudgingly so then you can go back to the mcdonald's i just yeah, yeah. I, I it's hard to make it stick yeah, that's tough. I think to go back and forth can be more damaging uh, than to be on one side or the other. You know, I think mm. vacillating back and forth amongst the worlds can be very, very hard, uh, not just physically, but mentally. Like, where am I? Where do I fit in all this? Um, so I, I agree with you 100% there mm. for sure. Yeah. How do you feel about, like... Um cravings and things just from your experience or what you've seen because i know some people say oh I'd, I'd love to like eat these foods but i'm just craving like these old foods because i know the gut microbiome plays a role in some of the cases but yeah how, how do you feel about cravings what's your perspective on that yeah i think cravings are a couple of different things happening i don't understand it all completely but i have a a, a feeling and i've seen some people speak to the fact that you know, whatever the foods that we're eating, those are the things that we crave. And whatever we've been yep. eating consistently, our microbiome and our, our entire system is kind of set up to be handling those things. And so the body mm. likes homeostasis. It likes sameness. It doesn't like uh, changes. Even though we might be eating all McDonald's, our body wants us to stay the same. Like that's like, it's a safe spot. It knows what's going on. Okay, a Big Mac's coming in later today. You know, I'm good. Um, even though it might be terrible for us, our body wants us to stay the same. So when you switch, it's like, hey, where's the Big Mac? Uh, we had a Big Mac yesterday and for the last six months, we better be having that Big Mac. So I think there's, there's a relationship there with our entire system as an organism. I think we, think of ourselves um, as individuals, but we're a community. Like this meat suit that we're in is a community of organisms, of organs, you know, conscious and subconscious and I don't know, frequencies. There's so much going on, you know, microorganisms. Um, so it wants us to stay the same. And so when we switch, it's gonna, it's gonna request, it's gonna make a request in some way, shape or form to get that old stuff. And no matter whether you're a Big Mac addict or a meth addict, if you're trying to get away from it, you just don't do it. it you know, that's the simple thing. You have to sit with it. You have to sit with that craving. You have to observe it. And then you have to say, is this loving to myself to have a Big Mac? And in the moment, if it is, then I'd say go with it. But if it's not, um, uh, if you can't honestly say to yourself, is this loving to me to do what I'm about to do, then I wouldn't do it. Um, so that's kind of that, that thinking process that I go through if I ever have a craving. And I certainly had cravings as I made transitions off of the old lifestyle that I had to the lifestyle that I have now. Um, 
Beyond that, I think there's also a satiation aspect that uh, contributes to the cravings. So mm -hmm. for people who are juicing, and I, I did this, I screwed, I screwed up. I, I made the mistake of not consuming enough calories. Like, and I'm not talking about over consuming calories. I'm talking about just getting enough to maintain a basal metabolic rate. Um, and so if you're not consuming enough calories to compensate for the energy that you're expending throughout the day, you're going to be hungry. Your body's going to say, hey, I need some fuel. And so in that case, uh, people in the juicing scenario or the raw food scenario, have some fruit, you know, eat, eat four bananas and tell me if you still want that bag of chips after you eat four or five bananas. So you, you smash a liter of grape juice that's 650 calories, you're not going to be hungry. You're not going to want anything. Matter of fact, you might not even be able to finish the liter of grape juice. So. I think there's the mental aspect and the homeostasis aspect of cravings, and then there's also the, the physical aspect of just not having enough calories. So those are the two ways that I like to approach cravings. Um, mm. just observe them, sit with them. Is it loving to me to cave to the craving and then smash some fruit or smash some juice? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's great, great advice. Um, in terms of like getting in those calories, let's say, um, let's say someone wants to embark on like a juice feast. Mm -hmm. Is there any like particular ratio you recommend? I know people um, they give like six to eight quarts or four to eight quarts, but obviously yeah. that's not very specific because yeah. of caloric density. But yeah, what are you, do you have any like recommendations? Yeah, and I generally fall into that that four to seven, four to eight range too. But I also like to throw in the caveat that it. it has to involve some consideration in total calories too. Mm -hmm. So the way it usually ends up working for me if I'm doing juice only is I like to have one or two liters of green juice um, and those will be a combination of some fruit and greens. So like apples and greens or um, you know pineapple and greens or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and those are usually you know three or four hundred calories each depending upon how much fruit I use and how much greens or cucumbers or what have you and then the balance of the calories for the day to get up to the the mark that you'd like to hit for the day I usually consume that in fruit juices and it's just easier to get more calories to level yourself up from a, a fuel perspective from fruit juices so fruit juices that I really like to to level up with pineapple juice orange juice um, water, melon juices, um, grape juice, those are easy juices to get a lot of calories in, you know, three or four liters to kind of get you up to the mark of where you need to be for the day. So that's how I usually like to mm. sort it out. And, you know, most people are in that 1800 to 3000 calorie range if they're super active or they're, they want to maintain working out or they've got a very strenuous work life or you know physical work that they're doing throughout the day then you know they're gonna need to be up there on the higher end and if they're focusing on resting their body and healing their body and regenerating their body and they're taking time to sit in the sun and meditate and you know take a break from everything you know the world and and all of those things then it might be lower on the calorie the calorie need mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to set the intention before you start out with a juice cleanse or a juice feast what do I want to get out of this uh, you know some people might want to do a 30-day juice feast but they can't they don't have the luxury to you know not work for four weeks so um, I think at that point they're going to have to be more mindful of staying leveled up on their calories and uh, it, it's very easy to get in a deficit pretty quickly and if you're shy of a liter or two or two of juice per day and you're living your normal life and work and stress and all these things that can add up and it can be substantial over the course of three or four days and you're setting yourself up for some issues. You're going to get cravings, you're going to get stressed, it's stressful on your body and you're going to break. You're going to want to break and so it's almost more stressful to to do that than to just say I'm going to have some fruit today. You know like 
Mm. You really have to set the intention with how you're going to go through this feast or cleanse and, uh, you know, act appropriately for sure. Mm, definitely. Yeah, I think the mindset, the, 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 the preparation in terms of mindset is, is key. Yeah. And on the physical side, how, how, how would you recommend someone prepares? Like, should they map out how much they're going to eat um, uh, or drink, sorry, or, or like where they're going to get their produce, how much? Like, how would you prepare men? Like, um, yeah, how would you get everything in place before, before you embark on a juice feast? Yeah, for me, what worked out really well was picking one to two days a week where that was, um, you know, I would set aside a window of time to make sure I had the opportunity to get the produce I needed to get, to stock up on the produce that I needed to get, as well as mm. make the juice. And I had the jars and the lids and had everything set out so that I could make, you know, three days worth of juice at a time so that I was set for those three days. Um, Typically, without any kind of vacuum storage, you can get about three days worth of um, um, uh, fridge time, you know, storage time on your juices without having spoilage issues or losing, you know, the enzymes and nutrients that, w that we want to maintain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, twice a week is usually a pretty good rule of thumb uh, in terms of juicing. So I would always pick like, you know, a Sunday or a Saturday to make sure I had three or four days worth and then midweek, like Wednesday, to kind of get me through to the weekend again. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would always work to, when I was doing longer term cleanses, uh, I would look for places where I could buy in bulk. So I found, when I was living in Indianapolis, I found a couple of wholesale vendors that I could buy case quantities of oranges, case quantities of grapes, case quantities of cucumbers. Um, and made it a point to make orders with them and pick up on a certain date. Uh, but some areas don't have that capability, so you can work with international grocery stores are usually pretty agreeable to selling in bulk. If you meet with their produce department, they can set that up for you. Um, or just, you know, stocking up at Costco or wherever the best place that you can, that you have available. You gotta work with what you have available uh, to get the bulk quantities that you need. So it really takes just setting out the intention, like, okay, it's going to take me two or three hours to get this produced for that much time of the week. And honestly, when you think about it, two or three hours twice a week is probably on par, if not less time than we would spend prepping food if we were eating solid food. So I mm. think from a time perspective, um, it's the same or if not less time that it would take to prep food, uh, you know, if you're cooking food or prepping solid food. So it can work out about the same, but it's just a little bit different logistically. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the thing Like you say, even cooking food, like it can take, you know, up to an hour if you're, if you're cooking like a proper elaborate meal. So yeah, for sure. in the grand scheme of things, it's not, it's, it's a worthy investment. And in terms of like an investment, do you remember like roughly how much it cost you or do you have any like ballpark figures how much it usually costs people or like maybe cost effective approaches? Yeah, it really depends on where you're at in the world. But for me, mm. um, and depend also depends on what, what you're using to kind of level up the bulk calorie needs. Um, for example, it's if you're in melon season, you can get a lot of juice from melons yeah. uh, pretty quickly, fairly economically. But if you were to do that same amount of juice in pomegranates out of season, it's going to be really expensive. So mm. I think it, you can you can do it very economically, or you can do it very expensively. So it's just important to be mindful of how you want to map out your calories. Um, for me, typically it would be depending upon how much I would splurge on certain types of fruit that were specialty in season, anywhere from ten to twenty bucks a day. And I would say my goal was ten bucks a day. Mm -hmm. So that would be about 300 bucks a month, which I think is pretty reasonable. Um, 300 to 450 dollars a month, you know, 10 to 15 bucks a day, uh, I felt like was a pretty reasonable gift to myself uh, in terms of the value that I would gain from that uh, from a health perspective. And I think one of the big, speaking about cost, one of the big things that I had to really change my mindset on was. You know, I was the type of guy that 
wouldn't hesitate to spend 15 bucks on a four pack of craft beer, mm. uh, but I would cringe at an eight buying an eight dollar bag of cherries. You know, it's like, oh, I can't buy those cherries. That's too expensive. But yeah. at the same grocery store trip, I'd pick up a four pack of beer, you know, for 15 bucks and be like, game on. You know, so I think bar tabs and restaurant bills can be a hundred to 200 bucks yeah exactly two or three times a, a, a month or more for some people but spending four hundred dollars on a juice cleanse would be like out of the question so i think it really comes down to the perspective that we have in terms of the the value that we're getting and what we're willing to spend i mean no one wants to be frivolous with the amount of money that they're spending but there are very economical ways to do this if, if you uh, if you set your mind to it and put a little work to mapping out the logistics it's very very easily to do this very cost effectively mm. yeah hundred percent hundred percent I think especially in the states because obviously you're, you've got health care costs as well like sure the medical bills obviously we pay tax and things like that mm -hmm. but it's like you say, it's a long-term investment. <laughs> yeah, if absolutely. you can't you can't enjoy life if you haven't got your health, so th there's really no better investment. So I, I agree, hundred percent. It's um, yeah. it's def it definitely comes back to the mindset, doesn't it? The, the it does. and just what you actually value in life. Like you say, like so many of us, you know, we prioritize things. Like you say, like the the case of beer or, or what, whatever you're you know your poison is <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite literally yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i lived it you know i used to make it and sell it for a living so no judgment mm -hmm. <laughs> on anyone who who chooses that as as part of their lifestyle of course, i can't yeah. judge it because i lived it for 40 plus years of my life you know to the fullest mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. more full than i should have <laughs> but um i think it's uh if if someone is going to make a statement about the cost of it, I think we need to look at all aspects of the budget and see what else might be um, in there that may not be adding quite as much value, whether it's other food choices or beverage mm. choices or entertainment choices. Uh, it's very easy to spend quite a bit of money on tickets to a ball game or a show or a concert or a night out or something like that. And here again, nothing against those things. I think those are all, can all be, you know, great parts of life um, if, if you so desire. But at the same time, you can't come back to me and say, well, that's too expensive. Oftentimes I'll, I'll get comments um, regarding cost uh, you know, on posts that I make with certain juicers. And yeah, there's some juicers that I have that are a couple thousand bucks. It doesn't mean you need that to uh, live a health, healthy and, and happy um, life. But I also uh, can't help but think that this person is sitting on their couch, they're holding a, a thousand dollar texting device, yeah. doom scrolling on the internet. And so, a um, hundred dollars a month in Wi-Fi, you know, so twelve hundred dollars a year in Wi-Fi, and uh, you know, a thousand dollar phone that they're going to buy a new one every two or three years without any question. But mm. yet, the juicer that has essentially a lifetime durability is too expensive. So it really comes down to perspective to me. I, I don't, um, you know, I don't drive a Maserati either, you know, so. I know I understand cost uh, considerations and and uh, you know not everyone wants to have the most expensive juicer nor do they need it um, but it, if you value it for your uh, life and your your intention and your well-being and it serves you you're worth it you deserve it like we have this vessel as far as I know one go around in this lifetime I don't know what happens after that but you know, while we've got it, it's it's up to us to take as best care of it as we can. And I feel like it's worth the best, you know, it's worth mm. uh, whatever you feel like is the most perfect use of your dollar for your well-being and your health and your intention. Then I say, go for it. You're you're worthy and you deserve it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just got a few more on juicing. Um, I'll just reel off real quick. So yeah. thought in my mind is like juices. You mentioned uh, like expensive juices and things so if, what what would you recommend 
Is there any, yeah, what what are your recommendations? Because obviously you've got like yield and mm -hmm. yeah, so what would you recommend for maybe like a good budget juicer or, and yeah, also one, like if someone wants to, you know, go, cream of the go. crop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the best inexpensive juicers that, that uh, I recommend it's you know usually hovering around 100 125 bucks if someone's interested in testing the waters and seeing if they're you know uh, able to kind of commit to juicing regularly and just want to see if it works out for them I would recommend picking up something like the try best shine juicer it's a you know it's it's inexpensive it's quiet it's got minimal parts it's easy to put together easy to use and you know it's 125 bucks. So try best shine, I think, is a great one if you're looking for a good, quality, inexpensive option. Uh, I've had, I actually bought one. That old juicer that I started with, the Champion juicer, didn't juice pineapple or greens or celery very well at all. So I wanted to try something else out. And so the try best shine is one that I tried. Uh, and I lusted after the Green Star watching Dan McDonald with his Green Star. And so I found a used one of those. And I think when I got the Shine and the Green Star and had the comparison between those two and the old Champion juicer that I had, I was like, wow, all juicers are not created equal. They all mm. do different things differently. So for an inexpensive option, I really like the Shine. Um, if someone is interested in more of a mid to high range juicer that's super convenient and super easy to use and super fast to use. Like you don't want to be bothered with, with um, you know, chopping up all of your ingredients to put in a small feed chute. Then I really like the Nama J2 or the Kuvings Auto 10. Uh, those are two of my probably top picks in terms of the really easy to use, convenient batch vertical juicers. Uh, they don't have the best yield and the best extraction of the creme de la creme of the juicers, but man, for ease and convenience, those, those two juicers have done so much for the world of juicing in, in terms of making it uh, easy and accessible and convenient. Like people just love the fact that they can load up the hopper with whole ingredients, close the lid, walk away, make three or four liters or six liters of juice and be done. Like mm. in 20 minutes, they're done. So I really like those two, the Kuvings Auto 10 or the Nama J2. And if you're interested more in juice quality and you wanna be more certain that you're extracting more yield, more juice yield and nutrients and phytonutrients and enzyme extraction. Uh, I really like the Green Star family, be it the Green Star Elite, the Green Star Pro, or the Green Star 5. Those uh, three Green Stars are really amazing. Uh, the Sauna 727 is really amazing in terms of yield and um, capability to extract nutrients. And then the best of the best is the pure juicer. It's a hydraulic press juicer. So that's kind of my range of recommendations and from, you know, really solid, mm -hmm. inexpensive option all the way up to the, the Maserati. I do drive the Maserati juicer occasionally. <laughs> Take it out for a spin. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. for sure. Best of yes. the best. So what are like, just real quick, what are like the different types? So obviously you've got like centrifugal, like masticating, and yeah. what, well, yeah, are there any you'd say like stay away from and are there any that are better for specific things? Yeah, I definitely stay away and I typically um, recommend people to stay away from the centrifugal style juicers. Mm -hmm. uh, advantage is they're quick, they're fast as well. But I think if you're willing to spend the money on a centrifugal juicer, you should probably, and you're interested in convenience, I would probably go for more of a cold press style like the Nama batch juicer or the Auto 10 batch juicer. You can still get the convenience, mm -hmm. but you won't have problems with pulp in the juice. Your yield will be better. Uh, it's just a better choice. So you've got those centrifugal styles. I kind of say, say stay away from those. Um, the vertical style like the Nama and the Auto 10 are, they're cold press um, in that they don't have fast spinning blades that generate heat, which 
degrade the nutrients and enzymes of the juice. Um, mm -hmm. They're great, they make great juice. The yield isn't as good and the pulp level, levels are a little higher than like the auger style juicers like the sauna or the omega or uh, the green star. So if you wanna uh, not be so concerned about convenience and you're okay with doing some chopping and a little slower juicing process, then I recommend those auger styles like uh, the sauna or the omega or the green star. And then if you really want the best uh, in terms of nutrient enzyme extraction, lowest pulp or zero pulp, then you're gonna have to bump up to something like uh, the pure, which is a hydraulic press juicer. Mm. Yeah, great, great uh, summary, great explanation. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. <laughs> are there are there any favorite juices of yours or any you'd recommend for people? Like, I know you say, obviously, and I, I resonate with this, there's no one juice for any like specific sure. benefit, but are there any like personal favorites? Yeah, I find myself um, going back and forth between if I'm busy and short on time, I really like to use the juicers like the Auto 10 or the Nama J2 just for their convenience mm -hmm. factor. But I, uh, if I've got time and I'm mindful of that and I'm really looking to make a nice quality juice, I find myself using the Green Star 5, the Sauna 727, or the Pure. Those are, those are really, you know, I think the whole reason we juice is to acquire the most concentrated, um, easily absorbable, easily digestible form of nutrition. And so if we're looking at that as a goal, uh, I think using a juicer that, that meets that goal is, is awesome if you have the, the opportunity to. So I really like those three, the sauna mm -hmm. or the green star or the pure. Those are the ones that make the best juice, mm -hmm. the most nutritious juice. So. Perfect. And yeah, I do apologize for my, uh, my accent and speaking fast, but in terms of like juices, so like the drink, what? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, no, it's my bad. I, I was speaking too fast. But um, are there any like favorite juices of yours that you drink uh, or would or would recommend for people? Yeah, if if I could recommend one juice for someone to put into their life every day, if they just had the ability and time to make one juice, I would really focus on making green juice. Uh, I think it's difficult in the modern world to get. Um, a lot of vitamins and minerals and mm. chlorophyll and phytonutrients in a raw living state. Um, and so I really appreciate the ability of green juices to do that. So what that means for me is typically um, a head of celery, uh, a bundle of parsley, a bundle of cilantro, some cucumbers, some lemon, some ginger, some turmeric and a couple of apples or a pineapple or some pears for sweetness. And I think what you get there is a delivery system. It's basically a way to flood yourself with chlorophyll, enzymes, phytonutrients, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory um, you know, attributes in a very easily absorbable, Easily, easily digestible and low metabolic stress format. It's such a, a great way to get nutrition that's very easy and gentle on the body. So if there's mm. one thing I could recommend, it would be making a green juice like that and getting 16 to 32 ounces a day, no matter what your dietary lifestyles you are, you know, no matter what that is for you, adding that in will only benefit you. Mm, definitely. Um, in terms of when people consume that, let's say like they're, they're on a whole food plant-based diet, mm -hmm. something like that, should that be first thing in the morning um, in terms of food combining? And should they chew it and drink it slowly? Because, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely like think. that. I definitely think that's a great way to do it. First thing in the morning yeah. um, on an empty stomach or whenever your first food intake is for the day. Some people delay it a little bit later in the day, but whatever that first... Um, you know, nourishment is for you at whatever mm -hmm. point of the day it is. I think that's a great time to get it. Um, your body is primed to receive that. It's empty. Your stomach's empty uh, after, you know, your overnight fast. You're breaking it with juice. is just a great way to flood yourself with good, clean nutrition. Um, mm. So I think it's great. And, and I do really like um, kind of just 
uh, doing in a slow manner, not, you know, not guzzling it, not shooting it back. This is a health, life-giving beverage. Uh, and so taking time with it just as you would with a meal, it's literally a meal. So yeah. take time with it, sit with it, chew it like you say, uh, to let your, you know, your salivary enzymes and digestive enzymes have time. Uh, I think no matter what it is that we're eating or drinking, being able to put ourselves in a calm state is when our digestive system is most optimal for digestion. So if we're in a hurry, we're on the go. I mean, we've all taken juice on the go or, or uh, you know, ate food in the car or what have you, but it's not the most optimal time in terms of digestion. And so mm. when our bodies are you know, if we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, evolutionarily, our body's yeah. not looking to digest food. So, um, on the opposite account, then, if we can just be calm and centered and focused and not be watching media, or just just be present with it, I think, is where we can really have the most optimal uh, experience mm. with it, for sure. Mm, definitely. Yeah, I haven't quite mastered the art of chugging a juice whilst running away from a <laughs> predator yet. <laughs> I'll let you know if I do. But. Yeah. yeah, the triceratops yeah. is uh, yeah. chasing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but no, 100%. I think, um, like you say, especially with media or stress, like, mm. it, yeah, it's, it's fight or flight response. And it can sometimes take a while to kind of yeah. downregulate our nervous system. Um, yeah, especially if you're watching something stressful while you're eating. That, that's enough to mess up your digestion yeah yeah I think um, it's a it's certainly something to fo to be mindful of I think we get such small doses of it, sometimes not so small doses of it but mm. uh, we get small doses of very stressful experiences in the modern world all day long you know whether it's being in a public place and a television on with media or you know news uh, or getting notifications on our phone breaking news or you know tragedies that are happening it's just like it's a it's a small but but abrupt uh, stressor mm. and why while in and of themselves they may not be you know they may not seem big just having those slow steady doses of stressful uh, situations occur throughout the day add up and you know by the end of the day you've been you know hit with all these different stressful experiences so your hormones of stress are always acting you know you're always just getting subtle doses of cortisol or whatever the other stress hormones are and they can add up and it's just not optimal for us so the more we can separate ourselves from that i think the better and particularly when we're eating eating and drinking i think it's in, important to to really be mindful of that um, when i first started learning about that and i started analyzing and being more mindful of what what my day looked like and the music i was hearing or the media i was watching i really became aware that i was inundated you know i was inundating myself with these stressors all day long. So I think um, as I started peeling a lot of those away, I found uh, that my life became a lot better. Things that mm. I had no control over. You know, there's a typhoon in you know, Southeast Asia. I, I can't really do anything about it. You know, I, I can send them love and, and, you know, well wishes and send positive energy that way, but uh, in the moment, I can't, I can't do anything. And so that having that, taking on that stress or that, that fear or anxiety um, is difficult for us to manage consistently long-term. Mm, 100%, yeah. Just, just touching on that quickly, are there any habits or things you personally adopt uh, in your lifestyle to de-stress or, or other ha lifestyle habits for, for long-term health and like longevity? Yeah, definitely for me, exercise has played a big, big role in yeah. uh, stress reduction. Staying active, um, you know, I went from being very physical in, in our old business, my old line of work, to being more digitally involved. And so really ma being mindful of staying physically active has been a big component for me. I like to, I like to run, I like to cycle, um, you know, I've been throwing some kettlebells around, just things like that to stay active. 
I mm. think are key. It's also nice, uh, you know, stress relief and stress uh, outlet for sure. Um, beyond that, meditation has been a big thing for me that I've really learned over the last uh, three years to, to incorporate and I've experienced profound effects from that in terms of just kind of being centered and um, being more mindful of the moment and not not living in those uh, emotions of the past. I think some, sometimes so often we get up every day and we're really just kind of reliving yesterday over again, you know. We get up and the first thing we do, we pick up our phone, you know. We start we start scrolling and, you know, then we go to the, the kitchen and make tea and then we, you know, turn on the television and then we, you know, go to work. You drive to work the same route, you know. there's. There, you can really relive these emotions of the past. Um, and when you're reliving the emotions and actions of the past, then pretty much you're predicting the future. It's just gonna be the same over and over again. So I've really been working on being mindful of, you know, envisioning the future that I want and becoming, uh, you know, believing in that, becoming in that and behaving that way every day so that I'm not reliving some of those old mistakes that I've made in the past uh, and meditation has been a huge help for me to just kind of stay immersed in a present moment state as much as I can. I'm not perfect, I'm far from it, but just really working towards that every day has, has really helped, helped me. Mm. I, I think before I meditate, one thing that's really helped me in the evening is uh, having a list written out for what I envision for the perfect day tomorrow. And that is fairly detailed. It's a list, kind of a checklist of like, okay, I wanna get up this time, I wanna meditate, I wanna brush my teeth here, I wanna have a juice here, I wanna have a smoothie here. You know, just kind of mapping out when I wanna exercise, when I wanna work, when I wanna have a break, when I wanna have time off, when I wanna be grounded when I want to get outside and then when I wake up it's already mapped out I don't have to mm. think about it I can just say oh check that off all right meditated cool I'm on. and when you get a couple of wins like before you even really get out of the out of the house uh, it really starts your day off nicely to have have that mapped out and get some wins and get the get the energy moving and get the the momentum for the day going, that's really helped me. I'm not perfect at it, but the more I stay on track with that, the better days I have, one right after the other. And it really helps mm. me achieve the goals that I'm after, for sure. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a similar thing like in the evening time, I, I agree. I think it's a good time to do it, because that way it kind of puts your mind at ease for the, the day ahead. and. At first I thought like, oh, maybe I should just let things flow a little bit more and not, not like structure or anything like that. But then I mm -hmm. found those days, the day kind of just disappeared. And by the end of the day, I was really annoyed. So, <laughs> so I think just having, having, yeah, that intention and, you know, athletes, they visualize. Yeah. It's important visualization and focusing on what you do want, I think is really important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, and I... I think about that too, like, well, I just want to flow with the day, but like yeah. you say, it's very easy to get off track, and uh, I, as I was talking about homeostasis a few minutes ago, our bodies are kind of addicted to those emotions of the past, and so it's very easy to kind of just get right back into that old track without even, you know, being mindful of it. So. Even though I might veer off a little bit on my plan, I can at least make a conscious decision, like, Oh, it might not, you know, I said I was going to exercise at 3.30, it's 2 o'clock, and I feel like it fits now versus 3.30. I think I'll do mm. it now. At least it's a mindful decision at that point in time, and I can be kind of in the moment about my decisions a little uh, yeah. a little better. So I agree with you, you know, being in a flow state is nice uh, as long as we can kind of be headed in that direction for sure. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like structure, but also being adaptable and not yeah. letting changes to your, like, perfect day like stress you yeah. out because then yeah then it's yeah, not so good kind of defeats the purpose for sure exactly. i like to be spontaneous too you know if, mm. if i've got something on my schedule you know um, if if i have the opportunity to do something that 
is loving to myself or, you know, can augment my experience for the day, then I'll go for it. You know, I don't hesitate to break it, but it's a mindful decision. It's kind of a, a thought process to go through it for sure. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And yeah, I'm just getting conscious of the time because it's, it's flown by. But um, yeah, if you want to finish with some rapid fire questions. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and just quickly on my mind, just very quickly, um, I think it's probably important. Just uh, how long should people like juice feast for like is it because i've heard this until you finish having solid bowel movements Mm -hmm. and then what would you recommend uh just quickly how people can break the fast because obviously i've seen some people break things fast with like raw eggs and obviously they end up in like in the hospital so i think it's quite important (laughs) just quickly touch on that yeah so for me i think it's uh kind of an individual case by case basis when i Mm -hmm. think about how people, how long people should consider going yeah. on a juice feast. I felt like for me, 30 days when I first started out, after I'd kind of gradually worked up to two or three days at a time and feeling good about that, I felt like 30 was kind of a nice point for me. Um, definitely, you know, being able to empty out the digestive system completely is a good rule of thumb, and that can be very different in terms of time amounts of time it would take to do it depending upon your past history and what you've been what your lifestyle has been like so uh, you know I would say in a perfect world probably 30 to 45 days if all other aspects have been uh, you know perfectly lined up for people in terms of how Mm -hmm. they've transitioned onto it I think that could be a really good rule of thumb for most Um, is it necessary for anyone to do like what I did 105 days or 90 days? I think there's a tremendous benefit in that if, if you feel called to do it. I just caution people on being dead set on that number. I think it's really important to uh, be mindful of what's going on with your body and if, if it's more stressful for your system or uh, you know, you're not having a good reaction to it or a good response to it. Pushing through just to hit the number, I, I don't recommend that at all. I'd rather you mm. stop and focus on just you know raw foods and fruits and 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 e- evening out that uh, experience than just hitting a number of 90 days. So um, really, case by case basis for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and definitely. Next part, of, next part of that question. Was, yeah, it was just breaking, breaking the oh, feast. Oh, breaking the fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to me, this is, you know, in a, in a way more important uh, than the feast itself. Uh, you know, you can really shock here again. It goes back to these uh, abrupt changes in what you're doing uh, and how that can affect the body. I, I think any time I see someone, like you mentioned, you know, having six raw eggs um, mm. to break the fast or, you know, going out to their favorite restaurant or, you know, having a big cooked food meal after being on a long, longer juice fast, it's just very, it's uh, very difficult for the body to um, handle those transitions very well. So what I recommend is make the majority of your transition be what you've been doing and that's been juice so if you've been on a 30-day juice fast juice feast um, then I would say for the next seven to ten days as you transition back to solid food the majority of what you have during that seven to ten days needs to be juice Um, and then what little solid food that you're having and experiencing needs to be like the ingredients you were using using to make the juice so it uh, needs to be raw fruits and 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 watermelons high water content grapes melons cucumbers oranges you know very easy to digest um, high water content fruits are typically what i think about cucumber is what i almost always break my fast with with solid food mm. for one i just have um, a, an interest in that crunch, you know, that crisp crunch of a, a juicy, crisp cucumber. When I'm yeah, breaking, satisfying, break, yeah, yeah, really satisfying. I don't, 
crave it per se, but it's like, ah, oh, that really sounds good to me. Like just a simple piece of cucumber, like no seasonings, nothing, just straight up cucumber. So things like that are what I encourage to people to add in on top of their juice. I don't like people to think about it like, I'm gonna have all this solid, solid food and then just have a little bit of juice. No, it needs to be the other way around. It needs to be mostly juice and a little bit of solid food in the form of uh, high water content fruits like cucumbers or melons. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Fat, the breaking it is key though because mm. uh, it can be very shocking if you do it incorrectly. And give yourself time, make sure you give yourself ample time to let your body um, adjust to those solids. Mm. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I'm glad you covered that because I don't wanna, don't want anyone to do any long-term yeah. damage you know? yeah, for definitely sure. not medical advice <laughs> no no for sure yeah. uh cool so i've got the rapid fire questions uh so yeah the uh, clues in the name just as quick as you can but obviously take as long as you need um cool so number one what's your favorite fruit favorite fruit i would probably say soursop mm. yeah never. is that obviously you're in florida now so do you, do you have access yeah, to them in Florida? I don't. Oh, we don't have them here. Yeah, we don't have. Uh, they don't grow real well here, but I have better access to them here than I did in Indiana. Uh, so I'm on the lookout for them for sure. And mm. when I travel to um, more tropical locations than Florida, that's usually what I'm looking for: soursop. Lovely, nice. Uh, describe yourself in one word. Uh, <laughs> um, consistent mm, nice what's one book that everyone needs to read one book everyone needs to read oh, that's a good one I would say juice fasting by Steve Meyerowitz nice haven't read it but yeah is it oh, um i'll add that to the list i've got, I've got yeah. i think they called it feng shui or something there's a no not feng shui there's a word there's a word where you have more books and you can read oh sure yeah <laughs> i don't know yeah. no i don't think it's feng shui but yeah what's the, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received best piece of advice i've ever received um probably along the lines of uh think think before you speak or think more than you speak <laughs> yeah i think i do that a lot <laughs> yeah it's, it's, yeah um what are three things that you can't live without uh water <laughs> brushing my teeth i really like to brush my teeth um Companionship. I love my wife. It's uh, mm. be tough to tough to be without that for sure. Water. Definitely. Brushing my teeth is kind of odd, but I really enjoy it. <laughs> I don't think I could go very long without that. And I miss my wife if she's away for sure. Mm. Yeah, relationships are key. Yeah, absolutely. What's your greatest strength and what's your biggest weakness? So this can be the same thing or two separate things. Yeah, greatest strength is um, persistence and. Uh, being able to see things through mm. and it could certainly it could certainly be my greatest flaw as well because sometimes no matter what I'll see it through to the end uh, mm -hmm. it's why I'm mindful of telling people to you know pay attention if, if there needs to be an exit at any point in time I think it's important to think about that but persistence and, and it would be my greatest attribute and uh, uh, certainly, certainly one that I have to be mindful of as well that I'm not overdoing it. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in having a purpose? If so, what's your purpose in life? Yeah, I do believe in having a purpose. I think um, for me, my purpose is to uh, help people to feel as good as what I feel and to experience that um, opportunity to feel well as a human. Um, 
you know, I think there are various ways to accomplish that, and it's not necessarily through diet or, or lifestyle completely, but uh, that, that seems to be my greatest purpose is to connect with people and let them know that uh, they're worthy and deserving of the best life that they could ever live. Mm. Sounds like a good purpose to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, what are you grateful for today? I am grateful for the opportunity to have this chat with you. I think, uh, you know, having conversations like this is just so awesome and um, it helps give people fresh perspectives if they're not exposed to it before. And so I'm really Mm. grateful that um, we had the opportunity to chat today. Yeah, man. Likewise. Yeah, it's really, it's really enjoyable. Um, I think, yeah, like you say, it's just, um, that new perspective or, or a new insight that resonates or just mm-hmm. yeah that it doesn't even have to be anything drastic but yeah it's, it's good yeah, and uh, yeah th- I appreciate your time and uh, wh- where can the people get in touch with you or you know what have you got going on where would you like to send the people yeah um, the easiest place to reach out to me would be any of the social media platforms I think probably at the moment Instagram is probably the easiest to direct message me um, and I have you know content there that I'm up- uploading constantly, but certainly um, also at juicertestkitchen.com. Uh, I post content there in a little bit more um, long form as well as YouTube. So Juice Feaster on YouTube, um, but probably the easiest way to reach out to me and, and get a response back from me is uh, an Instagram DM at Juice Feaster. Nice. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I appreciate your time once again, and I appreciate everyone listening this far. If you've made it to the end, (laughs) you're a real one. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Peace and love. Thank you.